Well, good evening. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, just a few uh, housekeeping points. Um, if you're looking for closed uh, captioning, there is a live transcript uh, button at the bottom of your Zoom screen if you'd like to use that. Um, we'll also be taking uh, questions at the end of the, uh, the panel discussion this evening. So if you'd like to feel free uh, as questions come to mind to go ahead and post them in the chat and we can um, address those questions as we go. Um, again, good evening. My name is Rick Legeski. I'm a faculty member in the Hospitality and Tourism Management Department here at RIT. And I'm very excited to welcome two phenomenal alums and fantastic people. I'm really looking forward to uh, having them share their experiences with you um, this evening. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll do a quick introduction to both Vicki and Lyndon. And then I think through the questions that we have this evening, you'll get a, a greater chance to um, know who they are, what they've done at RIT, what they've done since RIT. I think they give us a great perspective. Lyndon is a more recent grad and Vicki is a more seasoned grad. So I think it gives you a nice uh, perspective of um, where they are in their careers. Uh, I'll mention to Lyndon and Vicki, um, I'm imagining this evening we'll have alums, uh, potential students um, and current students uh, in and out of the audience. So as you're thinking about some of your uh, answers, you know, consider um, you know, those uh, perspectives also. So I'll start out uh, introducing Vicki. Um, Vicki has worked in the hospitality industry for her entire career from her teenage years to the present. She is current, she is the current RIT Alumni Association president and trustee so she's reached the, the pinnacle of um, her service to RIT. She was at RIT from 1989 to 1993. She graduated with a food marketing and distribution degree. She maximized her co-op placements by doing food service and culinary um, within both hotels um, and a purchasing project for Clyde's Restaurant Group in Washington, DC. She's done everything from working multiple presidential inaugurations at the White House um, to privately own restaurants and country clubs, the old Ebbett Grill, and uh, even hosted a White House, the White House annual Easter egg roll uh, and the 50th anniversary of NATO. She started her own safety consulting company and was the food safety liaison for a catering company to the FDA and the DC Department of Health for President Obama's commander in chief ball where the um, performance was uh, done by Bon Jovi. Her key mantra that she says has opened so many doors, doors for her career and to get to do unique things was be open to the possibilities. So we're really looking, to, uh, looking forward to talking to Vicki this evening. And uh, again, we thank her for her service as president of the uh, Alumni Association and her current role as a trustee on the board of trustees. Lyndon Pollan is Currently a staff accountant at the Four Seasons Resort on the Big Island of Hawaii. He graduated from RIT in 2018 with a bachelor's degree in hospitality and tourism management and minors in both accounting and Spanish. While at RIT, Lyndon was the founding president of Hospitality Financial Technology Professionals, HFTP, and founded and mentored the RIT Croatia chapter of Eta Sigma Delta during his study abroad. That's the current um, honor society for hospitality uh, students globally. Lennon was also the recipient of the Outstanding Undergraduate Scholar Award uh, in Excellence in Student Life Award. Uh, upon graduation, Lynn joined, Lyndon joined the Four Seasons Resort Finance Department as a finance manager and trainee, learning the core functions of the department, was quickly promoted to accounting manager before his most recent promotion to staff accountant. Lyndon serves on the HFTP Young Professionals Council and is currently preparing for the Certified Hospitality Accountant Executive Exam. So really excited to talk to you both this evening. Um, I think what we'll do is maybe work backwards. So we'll, we'll kind of start at where you are now and work our way um, back to maybe your time at RIT. So, well, I've kind of introduced um, the fact that, uh, Vicki, you're currently running your own company, your own consulting company. 
Uh, and Lyndon is obviously working at the Four Seasons as a staff accountant. Um, I'll start with Vicki. Um, what's it like, you know, right now to run your own company? Well, that, that got a little, wires were a little bit crossed there. I had, I at one point did have my own food safety consulting company. Um, I wound up getting, because my reputation in the industry, many in the hospitality know the company Ecolab. I, it actually was all because of Ecolab. I actually got bought away from my, my company and was wound up with founding farmers in the Washington D.C. area. So that was a, a unique little restaurant company that was actually owned by the North Dakota Farmers Union. And I, I as of October, I had been with them uh, just about four, little over four years. And um, actually, I've actually re retired out of the hospitality business. I'm still doing some hospitality work, um, which which not many people know, but at, you know, this is uh, exclusive content here on the webinar. Um, I do work for a private family, um, a very affluent, high-profile family, and do basically short of being some estate manager type stuff to personal assistant stuff to hospitality stuff. So that's that's kind of a new a new frontier that I, you know I've dabbled in. Um, but you know, it's certainly been it has certainly been the year of COVID um, has been just it's it's really paved the way for what what does the future really look like? What is hospitality really going to look like? And in so many in so many instances in business, it was you know it was pivot or die for some particularly restaurants. And I know that we got into you know a, a groceries and food retail, we, we, we tried to pull off a, a Wegmans model in like two weeks and everything from labeling to um, nutritional and, and, and everything that went with COVID really made it such a dynamic, um, such a dynamic time. So um, yeah, that's where, I'm at, that's where I'm at right now. Fantastic. Well, we'll come, we'll come back to that because I'd like to hear about how your hospitality background you know, prepared you for what you're doing now. So we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. Fantastic. Thanks for the scoop that you're uh, supporting the Kardashians. That's great. <laughs> so Lyndon, I know you're out in Hawaii and uh, obviously you're uh, maybe not obvious, but to the group, Lyndon's a, a former student that I know well. Um, tell us a little bit about um, what you're doing in your role um, as a staff accountant. Sure. So um, my role, um, it really is quite broad and encompasses a lot of um, areas within the finance department here. So I look at everything from accounts payable, income audit. Um, I do a lot of GL accounting. That's the primary um, general ledger accounting is the primary bread and butter of things, if you will. Um, account reconciliations, um, that type of thing. So on a daily basis, um, I oversee, we have um, an offshore income audit team that does work for us. So I help oversee that team. Um, and then also um, uh, just a lot of, um, it really depends on what comes up on a day-to-day -day basis, of course. Things are ever-changing and quite fluid. Um, but a lot of my, right now, since uh, we've just finished month end, um, so we're done preparing journal entries and everything, and now we're moving into uh, working on balance sheet reconciliations, other projects that um, are going on at the moment of um, implementing new standard processes that, um, that all accounting departments are expected to follow. Um, so working on those types of projects and um, just working on uh, more AP that uh, that's a continual that's a continual beast because once you once you have one thing tamed, there's always something else that's coming up in the process. So during the middle of the month, it's um, a lot of uh, a lot of projects that we're working on and um, and and working on balance sheets and making sure that um, and preparing financials as well to send to our ownership group as well um, at the end of the month. So. Thinking about what you both do, I guess I'd like to explore a little bit, you know, describe, and again, I know COVID, you know, changes all of our, our days. My day is quite different. I'm sure your days are quite different now. Um, but, but give a sense, you know, taking COVID out of the picture um, a little bit. Um, I'll start with Lyndon. You know, in the roles that you've had with your resort, you know, relative to accounting and finance and now as a staff accountant, you know, what, what's a typical day? Um, when does it start? What do you do? Um, give the audience a little bit of, you know, 
what goes on for you in a typical day? Sure. So um, on a day like today, during the middle of the month, um, when we're not in month end, um, I'll usually start work around eight o'clock. Um, I come in and check email right away um, to see um, what's going on with income audit because income audit starts um, around 3 a.m. local time. And so we receive emails from our offshore income audit team um, with areas that need to be followed up on um, or any sort of technical issues that they're having. And especially if they're having technical issues, those need to get resolved so they can successfully complete all their tasks for the day. So I'm really checking email first thing to make sure that any issues are addressed first thing in the morning. Um, I also take a look at um, the daily revenue report, which summarizes all the revenues for the prior day, um, checking to make sure that everything is in line as we would expect it. Um, and then if there are any um, major issues, uh, making sure that adjustments get made before that report, um, I send that to the ownership group um, for their review. Um, and then I also, uh, first thing in the morning, uh, work on um, reconciling revenues um, from a new club membership system that we recently implemented. Um, so I keep that pretty close, making sure that um, all the revenues are lining up as we're expecting them to and should be. Um, and then after that, it's really right now, um, the projects that I've been working on are um, currently preparing the month end financial packet for ownership. So it's a lot of compiling um, profit and loss statements, balance sheets, statement of cash flows, um, and other um, labor uh, reports that they're interested in and uh, look at every month. So I'm working on compiling financial package. Um, and then we also are working on moving to a new standardized house charges sheet. So I've been working on that. Um, and so really then picking up, picking up on the uh, on projects that are going on, also supporting the income audit team that we have here, any questions or concerns that come up, um, supporting them. And, um, and so like this morning, I was just reviewing the statement of cash flows, making sure that that was prepared properly, um, working on getting our um, ACH collection ready to go for our members um, that pay us every month and we automatically collect that out of their accounts. Um, so a lot of, um, so the, that, that type of, that type of thing. Um, I generally um, finish, I try to finish up between um, like 5.30 and six o'clock every night, um, but of course it all depends. So if it's a day during month end, I might be working till, um, till seven or eight, depends on, depends on how things are going. Uh, we're a bit short staffed right now um, in our accounting department. So everyone's putting in a little bit of uh, extra time and effort to make sure that we have a uh, smooth and successful month end close. Excellent. So in, in a typical time um, during the middle of the month, is it typical for you more, more than likely to be a Monday through Friday um, type role? Yes. Yeah. So um, I'm generally Monday through Friday when month end comes around. Um, so that can sometimes involve working a weekend. Um, it doesn't come up too often, but if it's necessary, I'll come in for a couple hours over a weekend just to uh, make sure that my portion of the job is getting done. Fantastic, thanks. Vicki, I don't know if you wanna share you, you know, your most recent job, which sounds quite fascinating without getting into obviously specifics. Um, sure. Sort of you know, what that entails. And, and as I said before, maybe how what you did previously in, in uh, your hospitality restaurant experience might have prepared you for taking on this, this new career change. A hundred percent. And if it's okay, I think, you know, talking about what I wound up doing at founding farmers as sure. president, uh, managing partner. Um, and so I was vice president of quality assurance and uh, purchasing uh, for, for the group and oversaw all, health safety, food safety, but then I also took on a procurement. And this was an interesting thing in hospitality. I, I, you know, I had having done both roles and again with the food marketing and distribution background, what winds up happening in a lot of companies that I saw across, you know, across the country and we were part of the National Restaurant Association Quality Assurance Executive Study Group, purchasing, purchasing and quality assurance answer to do two different departments. And purchasing wound up um, reporting to CFOs and quality assurance was a wide range of things depending on the commitment to food safety. It could be the president of a company, it could be a, you know, a regional ops, a VP ops, 
But what wound up, what was fascinating with our with, with, with the ownership of, of founding farmers is that they put the two together so that they never would fight. So nothing, everything came from a, a quality angle. And but yet you could get you could process the right RFPs and and weigh the the ROIs on, you know, you're gonna pay a little bit more for something that we can market and really continue to build the, the brand of the company um, on. So it was quite fascinating that we put them together because a lot of times the, de the, the departments would fight and a lot of times finance and P&Ls unfortunately would, would beat down quality assurance. So it was very unique for me to get, to get both jobs um, and, and combine them together so that quality truly was always in check but you still had the right chops to you know get the best get the best price get the best deals get the best discounts whatever that looked like so it really was fascinating and that job um the company was was we opened three 10 plus million dollar restaurants in 18 months which was just crazy so we almost doubled the company and at the time uh, I probably was working, I, I always had put myself on call, particularly for the group, just because the food safety aspects of it were really were a 24 seven nature. And, you know, whether it was crisis management or, um, you know, we had, you know, once COVID hit, it really changed everything. I don't think it's, it, we could have a whole other webinar on just COVID pivoting and operations, but um, so to get to, to be VP, I answered to ownership. Um, I want to say that I I, I kind of stayed toward Monday through Friday, but you were always available. And then you know the nature of our business is you know you work you work you you know you make hay when the sun shines. And if it was holiday weekends or you know extra hands were needed or you needed to, Thanksgiving for us was an at my absolute Super Bowl. You know to, just the sheer volume of food and the food safety issues, cooling being like the biggest thing. And then, and, and, and then three days after that, when you had the, you know, post, post food consumption. So um, the current job is, is absolutely fit. There, there couldn't be, my hospitality background from um, uh, taking care of people really was, the, was, was what was the driver of, of getting into this. And it, it really happened when I say be open to the possibilities. I didn't really plan on it. It just, you started at one place and then it just kind of grew. And, um, but at any given day, you, you work with, a, you know, a private chef, we've got, it could be, you know, private aviation, um, family matters, uh, tied to the business matters. Um, there's, there's some, you know, luxury good purchasing um, issues and, you know, really understanding some, you know, what's the different types of silverware, everything from Rolls Royce to Volkswagen. So um, it's been a, it's a really, it's a really neat job. And the, the, for anybody that's interested in more about that, I would say private aviation, um, yachting, uh, those markets are, are truly underserved. And I don't think a lot of people think about them. And it, it is a specialty skill. There is, there's, it's a lot of hard work to, to get into some of those areas, but it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. When both of you were answering the question, it made me think that um, I really need to have you both put into perspective those two jobs in terms of, I guess, scale and size. So Vicki, you, if you could just talk a little bit about the founding, the, the restaurant group, you mentioned opening three restaurants, you know, what was the how many restaurants were in the group, um, sort sure. of sales capacity, give the, the audience a little perspective of that they're probably not as familiar with the group. Sure, we, um, they are seven locations, uh, just shy, well, pre-COVID, uh, just shy, they were approaching $100 million. So, and we had, um, what's fascinating is between myself and another alum, and I think I saw or see Jeff Rowe somewhere. Is he, is he still on here? Or maybe he left out. But um, myself and another alum uh, in the D.C. area. So the, the, the restaurant that I was with was with Clyde's, and they wound up getting up to as big as, I think, 14, doing you know, 120, 130, 120, 130 million. So between my and another RIT alum 
is VP of food and beverage over at Clyde's. I'm VP quality assurance and purchasing. Between the two of us, we operate uh, seven out of the top hundred busiest privately owned restaurants in the country. So give, I mean, I, I understand those places, but can you give the audience like what, what uh, type of target audience, type of food, you know, what, sure. um, I know these places are not Applebee's, but I yeah. mean, give the group a sense then, of like what the average guest check is and a little yeah. bit about um, who the clientele is. It's, it's, it's casual. I mean, the most, the most famous one that I, that we mentioned earlier was the old Epic grill. That's, you know, a block around the corner from the white house. You'd see everything from tourists in shorts to, you know, uh, senators, congressmen, tuxedos, you know, whatever it was. And the interesting thing about the Ebbet being in the top, top five of, of the hundred was that their guest, the guest check average at the time, I think was like $35. And then, you know, they're going up against Tavern on the Green that's got, you know, a $200 check average. So the guest counts were just, just millions, you know, for, right. for groups. And it's, it's all, it was also the key why we had to have such significant food safety programs because the numbers were not in our favor as it pertains to the number of guests that were coming through the restaurant. So <coughs> reasonable guest check averages. It was just, you know, Old Ebbet Grill was breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And, and the founding farm, the farmer's restaurant group was a breakfast, lunch, and dinner model. So the, the guest counts were very high. And um, the, uh, and it was very, very casual fare. Yeah. And how many seats was the approximately? Oh, I kind of lost track. <laughs> um, oh, God. Uh, they probably averaged like 300 seats per Okay, fantastic. And then that was variable depending on patios. Right, great. Yeah. Lyndon, can you give us a little bit of perspective of the hotel you work for in terms of size, rating, uh, a little bit about um, that property? Sure. Um, so the property is on about 700 acres of land on the Co uh, Kona Kohala coast. Um, the hotel employs a total of about 1,100 people. It's a 249 room uh, resort, and we have about 350 homes on property. So this is um, somewhat of a unique um, setup for Four Seasons where um, we have a club membership component. And um, in order to be club members, members need to have a home on property. Um, we have two golf courses on property, about um, eight, nine food and beverage outlets. Um, so it's, it's um, it's a quite it's a large operation um, and one of um, one of the uh, largest uh, operations that Four Seasons has um, in terms of um, rates. Um, most recently, now over spring break, we had a um, very busy spring break and beat all expectations for what occupancy um, and rate would be. So, um, if you're looking at if you're looking at a rack rate during spring break season. It would probably be, uh, we were sitting between um, 15 and $1,600 a night. Wow. Um, so it's, um, it's, we're catering, of course, with those rates to quite high end clientele. Um, we have a department that's dedicated to our top suites. So if a guest books into one of the top 10 suites, they have what we call a suite experience manager. And that person, is dedicated to assisting them throughout their stay with um, dining reservations, activity reservations, um, really helping plan their whole itinerary for the trip. Um, so we're, we're catering to high-end clientele that has high expectations. Um, and our members, of course, um, property um, real estate prices are quite high as well. So of course they have high expectations and pay um, a pretty hefty um, membership fee each year and there's a significant um, deposit to uh, to just to join the club. Fantastic, thanks. Fascinating. Well, getting into some specifics about sort of your your skill sets, and um, I'll, I'll go to Vicky. You know, thinking about um, you know over your career since graduation, you know, what might be sort of the um, one or two skills that you, not so much technical skills, um, but you know, what skills do you think in terms of the different environments that you've worked in and, and the different boards and charities I know you've been involved in? Um, 
what are some skills that you sort of developed since graduation that you think have served you well? Sure. And the one thing I think I'd, I'd open with is while the, technically the food marketing and distribution program doesn't technically exist, what RIT is doing with some of the interdisciplinary components of the education for any of the students that I see on the call, th thank you for being here today, is that like if you would have asked me, you know, 20 years ago, the role of packaging science and sustainability in my career, I would have told you you were nuts. And now there are like two really significant um, components of, of what I did for purchasing. And specifically, I, I brought a really neat project to life um, based on, on the skill sets that I have at, at Founding Farmers. And I had done this at Clyde's. I had, I had worked with all local farmers coordinating a buying system, working with the chefs. Um, I literally picked up, picked up produce, dropped off produce. I took that experience. And when I came over to Founding Farmers, because we were owned by the North Dakota Farmers Union, they wanted to start running uh, an 18 wheeler truck, you know, once a month, once every other month from North Dakota with goods that the, the members of the North Dakota Farmers Union would make. The biggest one up there is wheat. Um, so we wanted to bring different, um, flour down from the state mill. So anyway, I wound up bringing this, this 18 wheeler to life and we, tra we tracked a path from North Dakota to Washington DC. And you had, you had to know everything from, you know, logistically and, and we would find these craft artisan um, organic, uh, what the heck was it? Grits out of, out of Kentucky. So at one point the truck wasn't licensed in Kentucky you know, the, the guy that was packing up the grits, we had to give him all the specification on the plastic bag. What did the tie look like? It can't become a physical hazard to food. You had to really understand how, how many boxes we could get on the pallet, the crush rates of the boxes, because it wound up being one of the last pieces of, on the load. So it sat right over the wheels. So you had to know, you know, what was gonna happen. It really, really affected the, the bounce. So it, it took us a couple loads where we'd open up the, the back of the trailer and the bottom three layers of these artisanal grits were just crushed. So we really had to, you know, in, increase the, you know, the thickness of the, of the corrugated boxes that they came in. So I would just say like uh, anytime that you, what RIT brings to the table from, from those type of skills, again, packaging, packaging science and sustainability. And now it's like under, and the two go together, like, why do you need, three layers of packaging on something. How do we get it down to one? And working with different vendors on how to do that, reduce cost, increase the, the, the green element of it. But the up to you know finance, doing so much finance, um, the thing that, the phrase that I think I've coined is that you know, hospitality gave me my start at RIT, but you know, the business piece of it is really what takes you to the top. You can't you can't run top hotels like the Four Season and be VPs of big restaurant companies and not be able to run your numbers and PL because at the end of the day, if you if you can't be profitable at it, it's I don't know if it's really a hobby or you're, you're going to go out of business. So that the the really if I did anything, I would have probably done a few more business courses at at RIT when I was there, but the ones that I did have really set really set me up for success to take it and run with it and have enough skills to get to the top of my career. So. Super. Thanks. Linda, I know you've been out a couple of years now, but thinking about um, maybe some of the, the skills that you may have developed you know, since graduation that have, that have served you well to date. Yeah. Um, so like you said, there's um you know, of course, there's a lot of hard skill that goes into certain things, but, and if, like Vicky was saying, I really appreciate you saying that finance and accounting is important because uh, I, I uh, couldn't agree more that it is, uh, it's incredibly important knowing your numbers, because like you said, if you don't have, if you don't know your numbers and how things are performing, there's no business. Um, but aside from, aside from the hard skills, because there's plenty of that, uh, that goes into accounting and finance, um, but soft skills. And I think that, um, I think it's often not thought about when getting into accounting is just um, having really strong communication skills, um, making sure that if, um, if you're leading a project or um, you're working on something um, with other people on a, on a um, maybe interdepartmental team, 
and making sure that everyone is on the same page. Um, communication is just such such a big part of it um, that it can be the difference between um, sending one email about something or having like a whole email thread back and forth because now people, different people had different expectations of who was doing what or how something was getting done, what the time frame of it was. Um, so I think being able to communicate clearly, concisely, and um, and in a timely manner is is one skill that's really quite important um, because especially during um, during the pandemic we were watching our accounts payable quite closely um, and so we're not pay we weren't paying every vendor every week and so we're making sure we're timing our payments accordingly um, to make sure to monitor our cash flows um, and so it, making sure that the operations managers when they need something paid that they understand if the, your invoice makes it into the system on this date, it's going to, it could be an additional this long by the time it gets approved, it makes it onto a payment run and it's approved by ownership to actually be paid. So those kind of communication skills, making sure that everyone has, is operating under the same set of, um, uh, uh, has the same information and the same um, expectations for things, that's, that's really important. Um, and I think, um, not often thought of when um, when in the one in a finance and accounting area, but that's something that I knew was important before. But as you start dealing with, um, as I've started dealing with more and more people that um, all have different things that they want or need, becomes it becomes a critical piece to it. Yeah, Rick. One of the areas I'd say that I, I didn't do anything with it but I know one of the key areas, and again, I say this for the students, and I know that some of the curriculum is really gonna be targeting um, human resources. It is the hottest area to be in right now. Human resources and hospitality, you can't find enough of them, and restaurants are, are one of the, the top areas right now that have just significant HR issues. <laughs> and second piece is, um, technology and uh, uh, data analytics. The restaurant industry as a whole is really, really, really behind in that because it's a huge investment and it's so, it's really hard to get people to think about what that uh, what the ROI on that is because it's so, so few people are investing in it. But it's, it's when we look at where wages are going and smart kitchens and, you know, it's, it's a huge issue. And again, it, it all ties back to finance and Running uh, labor costs, of course, is one of the biggest expenses uh, on that PL right now. Great. Well, kind of the last area to touch in terms of your your careers, and then kind of we'll touch a little bit more directly into to RIT and maybe some co-op and, and experiences as a student. Um, uh, I'll start with Lyndon on this one because I've I've kind of thought about you through some of these events. So um, you know, you 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 moved to Hawaii. We have um, volcan volcanic eruptions in Hawaii. We have COVID. We have some pretty major things going on in the globe. Um, obviously, uh, Hawaii as a state is a set of islands that uh, can easily be cut off from the rest of the United States. So I guess if you could talk a little bit about what that experience was like for you, um, both personally and professionally to sort of be on an island uh, starting your career, and then you have some pretty major things sort of shape the the economics of Hawaii. Yeah, so um, yeah, moving, to, um, of course, prior to moving here, I had never lived on an island before. Um, and so uh, moving here from a personal perspective, it was just kind of understanding that um, certain things move slower um, because shipping times just take longer. Um, like a couple weeks ago, for example, um, I had a crack in my windshield and so that needed to be replaced and the wrong glass was ordered the first time. So then it was going to take a whole other week for the barge to bring the other piece of glass that was the correct windshield. So just very basic things like that. It takes longer and things are also more expensive, um, which also would it make sense too. Um, but being on an island, it um, it's it, it definitely... Um, I thought at first I was slightly nervous that it might feel um, like small or that I was, um, I guess you could say like uh, kind of trapped if you will, but it definitely doesn't feel like that at all living here. Um, it's, uh, we're on, I'm on the biggest island of the chain of Hawaiian islands and there's so many um, unique areas on the island. 
to experience and visit that sometimes like you can go from one side of the island to another, one place to another. And it doesn't feel like, um, feel like you're on the same island depending on what you're seeing all in the course of one day. Um, but then in terms of um, professionally speaking, I actually, I started in 2018, uh, which was shortly after um, the, uh, the last um, eruption. And that was the eruption that, um, that devastated a number of homes on the east side of the island. And so that definitely, despite, that, despite the volcano and all the volcanic activity being on the east side of the island, it still um, hit our business because people aren't, um, a lot of people have, um, they're not exactly paying attention to where things are exactly taking place in proximity to where the hotel is located. Um, and so they're um, canceling out of fear of the volcano when the lava is on the other side of the island. I always joke with people and I say, you know, it's not like I'm, you know, driving to work and, oh, I just made it across the road when the lava came flowing behind me. That was not the case. Um, unfortunately, um, like on a more serious note, unfortunately, that was the case for some people on the other side of the island. And it's a very serious and catastrophic thing that happened. Um, but that that definitely took, an, that was definitely a large impact um, to the business. Um, but of course, COVID was even more significant. And so um, we were, the hotel was closed from the end of March and we didn't reopen until December 1st. Um, but during that time period, it was, um, the closure actually fell in a somewhat advantageous time because ownership was working on a renovation project. So um, starting around March and um, until the time we reopened and it's still going, but during the bulk of the closure, um, all of the, most of the guest rooms and suites were renovated. Um, and there've been a number of other enhancements going on um, on property. But what we also noticed during the closure was that we saw a huge increase in membership numbers and the number of members and their families staying on property. Um, Hawaii has been, um, in rela uh, relatively speaking to the rest of the US, we've done quite well in terms of COVID numbers and cases have stayed quite low, which has been um, really good. And so we saw a lot of members coming here and Hawaii being a safe haven um, from COVID in the rest of the United States. Because like you were saying, Rick, Hawaii is cut off from the rest of the US. And in some ways that's good, in some ways it's not good. One of the ways that it's good is it kept a lot of COVID cases and a lot of the problems that COVID brought to the mainland off out of Hawaii. So we were able to, um, we were able to keep cases low and um, have pretty smooth, have a smooth reopening and so we reopened for the festive season and welcomed our first guests back in December um, and really ever since Hawaii has been seen as a, as a very safe place to travel and of course um, it was talked about for such a long time that there would be so much pent-up demand in hospitality and tourism for those businesses and for us there definitely has been. Um, we've been beating our budgeted, uh, what we had budgeted for the year, we've been beating those numbers quite significantly so far. And the pent up demand, we keep taking, the forecast keeps going up every week. Um, so while there definitely are advantages and disadvantages on the reopening side of things, it's been a huge upside for us um, that I know plenty of places that are still, that are still in lockdown or having very slow recoveries, low occupancies. Um, we're, um, we're kind of going gangbusters right now. And I feel very lucky to be working here knowing full well that um, I could still be, um, I could still be without a job right now, um, or I could be without a job right now. And so, um, yeah, it's definitely, um, it definitely has its pros and cons for sure. But right now it's, um, we're really seeing a major upside here. Fantastic. So Vicki, when you realized that um, the pandemic was really impacting you know industry and restaurants and and we you know started to realize just how bad things were and, and the closures that were starting to happen sort of where what were you doing then and, and sort of how did you maybe um you know adjust the way you were thinking about your career um well you know being in some inner circles of food safety being in the nation's capital close to you know FDA and one of the biggest issues being in food safety is that so many of my other colleagues were like, "Why? Why are you calling me? This isn't a food safety issue, you know. It's a, it's a, uh, it's it's a, uh, uh, a uh, what was I going to say? Uh, 
Public health crisis? Uh, yeah. Uh, infectious disease control issue, you know? And so, you know, you, we just were not exactly skilled at that, but you were the best thing that, that owned. And, the, and so the, the hardest part for me was just, you know, it, it's, we had just put an HR person <laughs> into place. So between she and I just coming up with, with policies that, that between it became a huge HIPAA issue, um, and then, you know, if you had a really solid food safety plan in place to begin with that, that really tackled employee health and norovirus and, and not working sick and, and having, you know, great sick pay policies, you were, you were in a way better place than a lot of people that like had, had, or that didn't have anything. So, you know, we could, we, you know, if you were hand washing on a regular basis, you were, you were already a, a ahead of the curve with training programs and, and, and corporate culture that was really dedicated to that sort of um, activity. So it, uh, gosh, it was such a, was such a blur. Because, so it was, you know, it was really February. We saw it, we saw it coming down, down the, the, down the tunnel, like a, like a the light in the end of, you know, freight train. And we, we, we did our best to, you know, make changes, make it, you know, changes to the operation on the fly without government involvement. And then it really started blossoming and then government involvement wound up shutting down things faster than we could, that we could handle. And then, you know, what do you do with people? What do we do with food? You know, it was, it was, it was tumultuous at, at best and, you know, just weren't built, built for it. And then once you could start doing different things and just the role of curbside and, um, you know, just packaging the, the supply, the supply chain of, you know, mass toilet paper, um, the shift from you, you've heard about the, like the ketchup packet shortage in America um, is another supply chain issue that was, that's been driven by all the, you know, Uber, Uber Eats and all the delivery platforms. Um, I t always tie back to the finance again, you know, when you shift your PL to, you know, 60%, using a third party platform, you just don't see the same, the same profit. And then, you know, who you try to raise prices and guests are pushing back and COVID fees. And, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was crazy. So what was I doing? You know, I, uh, I had a team, I actually had a team of two and she, she spoke, she was of Hispanic descent and really, you know, she had the gift to speak Spanish and she really kept kept the crews in the kitchen um, calm, <laughs> informed, educated with a lot of buy-in. So she was, she was a really essential part of the team. Um, what else, what else did you ask? What was it? No, I, I think you hit, you know, you, you hit it. That's perfect. Yeah, no, it was, it was, it was super stressful um, as it was for, for everybody just to watch your, your business, you know, just come to a crashing halt and, you know, we were on, we were on track to, we were doing record numbers, massive record numbers. And we had three more restaurants in the pipeline that just came to a screeching halt. Um, so it was, it was, it was a tough period of time. Um, for me, I, you know, being in the industry for as long as I had been, you know, I, I really, it, food safety was, food safety was my thing. And I had, I felt that I had done what I could do. Uh, COVID had come and just, I had, I had set up the systems. I had fixed all the purchasing. You know, we, we saved, you know, we, we were fixing food costs to, you know, make better numbers on the PL. And I just had said, um, you know, I've had a great career. I want to go out on my terms and from the restaurant business, when I got bought away from my food safety consulting company, which we could talk about starting your own company as a whole other topic. Um, I had said, I would never, I'm not, I'm not going to ever work for another restaurant group after this one. So I had known that that was it. And then COVID came and I had just uh, set them up for success and moved on to something else. Great. So I want to talk a little bit about RIT time. I know we've got a little bit of time left, but I think co-ops are a really important part of the experience at RIT and, you know, often help students decide what they want to do and don't want to do, and obviously shape who you are a little bit. So I'm going to, uh, ask Lyndon first, because I have very um, specific memories of this experience, um, at least in the class, and I'd like to hear Lyndon's perspective. So Lyndon, um, 
what was your first co-op at RIT and, and how did that come about? Uh, so my first co-op with RIT was the Disney College program. Um, I went to Orlando, Florida for six months where I uh, got to wear a nice uh, baby blue and uh, pink uniform working at Restaurant Asaurus in food and beverage. Um, and that opportunity came about actually through Rick's class and um, needing to apply for the Disney College program as one of the assignments. And um, little did I know that the application process would continue moving on and on and on until it became, uh, it became a real thing. And I was actually um, going to... Uh... Just froze. And then, so, then if you could start over, you were just going um, at the end of this ongoing process that continued in the hiring. Sure. So um, I, so after, so it kept going and going until I found myself um, moving to Orlando. And uh, I, so I was at RIT for one semester and then uh, packed up shop in Rochester and headed to uh, Orlando and definitely a, um, a unique way to start my college career. And I definitely didn't think I would be uh, in and out of Rochester so quickly. And so how did that that um, experience shape you either, you know, professional goals or just personally going off and doing that for your first co-op as a freshman, only having completed one semester? Yeah, so I um, I got to see, it was, it was an interesting experience seeing how a theme park like Disney operates because it's, of course, it's such a, such a large scale operation with so many interconnected parts. And so that was really, um, that was really interesting to see. Um, and it kind of, um, it opened my eyes to really kind of what happens behind the scenes to, uh, to make the magic, if you will, for um, all the people that come and visit. Um, and so that was, that was really interesting. Um, but at that point, um, it was, it kind of helped me um, get my feet wet in a way. And um, I wasn't exactly sure at that point where I wanted to move um, with my career and exactly where I wanted to see where I wanted to go. I was a freshman at that point. And so I didn't really, I didn't, uh, I didn't know exactly which direction I wanted to take things. And it was more toward um, after getting into hotels and after my last co-op working in Hershey, Pennsylvania um, at the Hershey Lodge as a housekeeping supervisor, that was, that was kind of, that was my first, um, my first supervisory experience um, on that co-op and helped and um, really operationally intensive co-op and helped me learn that while I enjoyed the operations and I could do that, that really wasn't an area that I saw myself really excelling at and being a, um, and really being the best fit for me moving into the industry. And so at that point, I knew that moving down the finance and accounting route um, was gonna be where I, um, was going to be something that I would be more comfortable with, be better at, um, and kind of where I wanted to fit into the hospitality industry. And so, like you were saying, Rick, um, co-ops definitely help figure out what you want to do and also what you don't want to do. But I think having that operational experience was um, really important. Now, granted, I wasn't seeing like high level major operational decisions by any means in those co-ops, but I think it was still important knowing what like what a housekeeper goes through and does on a daily basis, what happens at a food service operation on a daily basis, um, because I'm now on now being on the finance and accounting side, I'm working with managers in those departments and having at least though I haven't worked in housekeeping or food and beverage with Four Seasons, I at least have some background to bring to this position in operations to know how to relate to operations on some level rather than coming in as you know oh this is a finance and accounting guy who doesn't, who doesn't, who does, he doesn't know how our operation looks. So he wants us to, you know, cut this expense or cut this cost or whatever the case might be, but he doesn't know exactly how things function. Now, granted, I don't know exactly how all the operations function here. It's impossible, but I do have some idea of how operations do work. And I saw, I thought that was an important part before kind of moving into moving into a more back of house role that really doesn't see the operation of course, on a daily basis. Great. Vicki, going back a few years, obviously, what, what co-op sticks in your mind most or was the most beneficial um, or maybe the most fun, but what co-op um, experience maybe helped you the most? Well, two, two, two were outstanding for me. One was uh, when, I wanted, when I went to go do my 
hotel stint, I went down to the Don Cesar in St. Petersburg Beach, Florida. And um, I had I had driven down there, I don't, you know, I, my dad knew a friend that had a condo, so I had a free place to live. And it really, so everything about co-oping for me was networking. I either had to knew, know somebody where I wanted to go to have a place to live. And I went, I went down there, loaded up my car and, you know, I kept, I kept trying to call and talk and apply. And, and I, I went down without a job, but I, I got one um, front desk wearing a pink, pink. Outfit. Um, but the key thing about that co-op is that I, I was still struggling whether I was gonna be real culinary or what was I gonna do? So they had a really beautiful dining room and a, an amazing executive chef. With that co-op, I wound up talking to the chef and you, they wouldn't pay you overtime. And I, I'm, it's a total HR nightmare that I'm gonna even say this because I don't even know if you can do it. But anyway, what I did is I worked my 40 hours on the front desk and it was usually a day shift. And then by five o'clock, I went and I had asked the chef if I could volunteer in this beautiful, amazing kitchen for a letter of recommendation and reference that, you know, I had some skills if he thought so. So I still, I still have that letter to this day from that chef saying, you know, anybody would be lucky to hire you. So it was a lot of work, but the, in some of those situations, if, if you know, that the, cla the cliche phrase, the world is your oyster, if you want to get experience at something else and, and you can volunteer or ask questions, particularly if you wind up in those scenarios where you get, you know, somebody that's really interested in, in your future and you show a lot of initiative and inquisitiveness. Um, I got that letter and, and, and probably could have went a whole culinary route. I could have went a hotel route. I just, I wound up not, but, um, and then the, the, the key co-op for me was the one that I finished on. And again, I don't see Jeff here. And I say this, I owe, I owe the rest of my career probably to Jeff because at the time it was all about networking. He knew an alum in DC this, that, that was at Clyde's and I went down and, and, and interviewed, he connected me. So it was alumni to alumni. And he said, I have this, this girl, she's gonna graduate. She's got a last co-op to do. Could, would you talk to her? Interviewed, brought me on. Uh, long story short, I wound up working for that company um, for 16 years. We're still good friends. And again, we, it was that whole alumni connection, the, the networking, the, the, and, and how RIT does that through co-ops. So for anybody that's out there, we have an amazing, uh, amazing group of, of alumni that are, you know, get kind of tight knit when we see our own out there because we know what the curriculum was like and, and how that they're going to be great future leaders of a company. No, I think that's a good ending point before we try to um, get into some uh, some questions. Um, you know, I think, you know, knowing you both, um, the importance of networking uh, is really key. I know you both um, give back and stay involved in the department. I know you're, you've helped other students, which is fantastic. You both were extremely involved while you were here as students in professional organizations, social organizations on campus. So quite well-rounded, um, you know, so I, I think for anybody here that reaches out to either Lyndon or Vicki through LinkedIn or, you know, through the department, they're two fantastic people that are well-connected. And I think it's important, I try to tell students this, that, you know, don't judge a book by its cover, you know, so you might look at Lyndon and say, oh, you know, I don't want to do accounting or Vicky you might say, oh, I don't want to do quality or, or health or what, what is this stuff, but not realizing who they've worked with or where else they've worked. I mean, I know Lyndon studied abroad in Dubai and Croatia, obviously worked for theme parks. You know, Vicky's worked obviously some very large events, large um, yeah. fundraisers for. My you know, premier food safety client was Jose Andreas. Right. So, I mean, the networking that you don't know behind the scenes for individuals that you meet, you know, don't judge somebody by their, their title or their career, because it's probably a vast, you know, diverse set of experiences that got them to where they are today. So um, kind of my last words of advice there, but thank you both very much. I want to make sure we get to um, either any questions that someone wants to put in the chat. Um, I'm not sure if the they're allowed to um, audio through on the way this webinar is set up, but do we have any questions for Vicki or Lyndon? 
while those are coming through, Lyndon, I would say while I was in DC, I did have an offer from the Four Seasons to be, um, I think, head of purchasing there many, many years ago. But through some other networking, I unfortunately heard the chef was very difficult to deal with. I was like, okay, <laughs> we're not doing that. <laughs> I still have that letter too, because it was a, it was an honor to get an offer. Any questions from the audience? I know we're getting down to the end here. Yeah, I, I think one of the, th one of the notes that I wrote, you know, is for students and as we're trying to attract other students or enrollment, it, you know, people get really nervous about, you know, it's really challenging sometimes I think with some of the, um, the salaries, entry level salaries for hospitality. And I know I've had many, many conversations about how to really, how to really position our, our future students, our current students, and even, you know, alumni on how our education and campus experience should give more consideration to a higher, a higher pay upon entry level. And then I think we have, depending on how you're networked and working with other alumni or referrals, how you move up farther faster with our, with our degree. So I've got a question here. What are some key classes that I can take for my senior year? Um, you know, I think, think that question probably falls a little bit more towards me with the current curriculum. Um, so I, I can, um, are you talking about your senior year of uh, college, high school? I'm sorry. Um, mm. It's coming from, thank you, high school. That was kind of going to be my guess. So um, I'll shoot this out to Lyndon, um, and then maybe I'll step back into it for a second. Um, Lyndon, thinking about, you know, your, your RIT experience not too long ago, you know, what are some key things that maybe you did do or would do differently in terms of coursework in high school your senior year? Sure. So um, at my high school, we didn't really have a hospitality class, but I knew that I was interested in hospitality at the time. And so I had pretty much um, exhausted the, uh, the business course offerings. And so I made my own class and uh, knew one of the teachers quite well and actually did a hospitality independent study. Um, and so um, I did that that semester, which are one of the semesters, which was, um, which was more of an exploratory um, experience that helped me get an idea of kind of what, what was all out there in the hospitality industry and where I might be interested. Um, but if you're considering getting into um, getting into hospitality and getting into business, I'd suggest taking an accounting class. Um, I took an accounting class in high school, and um, I remember that made um, that made my first um, the entry level accounting class at um, at RIT like the first half of it a breeze because it was mostly a review from. Um, what I had done before. And also things move quite a bit. Uh, it, it moves a lot faster in college. I took one year of high school accounting and that was covered in the first um, like four weeks of the college class. Um, so I think that's, um, I think it's important to, uh, if you're considering going a business um, route, that's that would be important. But also if you have good connections with the business teachers at your high school, try to make your own class if you're interested in exploring hospitality. So there's a question um, from Carter about um, minors and um, either one that you would recommend or maybe regret not pursuing. You know, Lyndon, I know you did a couple minors. You want to just touch upon the minors you did and, and why you chose them? Sure. Um, so I did um, accounting in Spanish. Um, Spanish, um, I did that more if I would um, get into a, um, depending on where my career might take me, to have some foreign language experience. Um, now I really don't use my um, Spanish um, learning all that often, um, but accounting um, was definitely a really strong minor to have for me to complement the hospitality major and have the accounting minor, um, and that definitely um, helped me gain some of the uh, the basic accounting skills that I needed to help the hard skills to help me uh, start being successful in what I'm doing now. You know. Um both Lyndon and Vicki, maybe I'll kind of, I don't know, morph this question a little bit and get your thoughts on it. But there's a question about, you know, besides food, hotels, theme parks, other industries, 
you know, what might be some other industries that people could get into in our travel agencies applicable. And I guess what I would say in, in get both of your thoughts and, and Vicki, you alluded to it a little bit and uh, Lyndon, I'm sure you can touch upon it, but I, I think the, the digital supply chain or the third party connections, right? So from a restaurant standpoint, you know, these food delivery companies are really acting sort of like agents in some regards, you know, um, and, and having a relationship with the customer and the restaurant as a middle person. Um, and then I, I'm sure with, with Hawaii in terms of its global reach that for some markets, you know, they're really relying on um, travel companies and, and big buyers of travel services. Um, so can either of you want to touch upon a little bit about sort of the, maybe what travel agencies really are today in terms of a, a modern way to think about uh, that role for either sector, restaurants or hotels? Um, I, my, maybe Linda, you might have a different perspective, but I would only throw, I would answer the question differently. Uh, um, the other area to think about is um, contract feeding. Uh, the second piece is as it pertains to um, sports venue management is, is another wonderful area. Um, venue management in, in, in general, um, when you look at the, the, the levies and the airmarks of the world really are the drivers of, of a lot of these stadiums and the food service. Um, and then uh, theme parks was a good one. Uh, sports, sports was a really big one. Oh, and believe it or not, um, a, a assisted living homes, like for the 55, 65, what some, like some of the hotel, some of the hotel models that are starting to cater toward these, this aging population and getting enough people that understand some of that. Um, I know the, the hospitality school in Orlando there, uh, I forget his name, I should, should know it, but anyway, they've created a whole curriculum just on how to, how to manage those things because, you know, on, on, you know, Rolls Royce to Volkswagen, people are, people are going to need places to, to go and live. So that's going to be another hot area. And then I've already mentioned HR. <laughs> cool. Then you want to finish up? Sure. Um, I think um, like Vicky's, like we've been saying, and Vicky really heavily emphasized um, technology is an important area. Um, we have an IT department on property, but of course we're using a lot of outside vendors for all of the, the variety of systems that we have on property and that we're using. Um, and there are plenty of hospitality technology companies that are well-established, um, making inroads in the industry and um, getting their software and systems out to make hotel operations more efficient um, or more profitable, whatever the case might be. Um, so technology is really a big area. Um, this may not necessarily be a, um, start, a career starting area, but I think it's also important to consider um, what happens above the property level. A lot of um, hotels, have um, owner, ownership groups, it's actually a group. And so there are um, people that, um, asset managers and um, analysts that work at um, asset management firms and hotel and with hotel ownership groups. Um, that's another area that's I think fascinating. But I think um, considering, consider like what hotels or what a restaurant, the suppliers and the people that they depend on to make their operation um, work there are, there are areas within hospitality um, in those places. Um, spas are another um, spa uh, or sports clubs, um, country clubs, another thing to, uh, to keep in mind as well. Fantastic. Well, we've gone over by about five minutes, but I think it was worth hearing those, those answers. And I really appreciate both of you committing your time this evening. Um, I would uh, strongly suggest all of you, if you're not already connected to Vicki and Lyndon on uh, LinkedIn that you reach out. Uh, they're great people to know. And I'm sure you'll see Vicki again in her role and as a trustee and also as the president of the Alumni Association. And Lyndon's been great in terms of committing his time to, to help with um, student clubs on campus um, while he's out in Hawaii. So thank you both. Stay well and uh, have a great evening. Good night. Absolutely. Feel free to reach out anytime and any other questions, message, do Messenger and LinkedIn. Happy to, happy to help. Great. Thanks. Stay well, guys.